Okay. So today, um, our topic, as it says on the title page, is Dove's most successful failure. Right? The, probably the uh, the bane of his, uh, you know, of his of his tenure as king, of his rule as king, was the whole um, episode with Bathsheba. But let's just do a little background before we um, get into the Pesukim. But essentially, let's you know where we left off last week with Abigail. That was when he was still on the run from from uh, Shaul Hamelah. Um, once that period of being a fugitive ended with the death of King Saul, um, he was you know, he was no longer a threat, and David was able to come back and start to really act as king. He wasn't uniformly accepted across the board by everyone. There were still supporters of the family of Shaul, and they had to enter into some negotiations. We talked about those negotiations a little bit when we talked about Michal, because she was one of the key points that he was making his uh, decision based on, was if you give me back Michal, then we can talk, you know? Um, but uh, once they entered into these negotiations, they all agreed, and there was this unified sense of David being the king over the entire Entire Jewish people. Um, he relocates the Ara, he conquers Jerusalem, relocates the Ara on there, really starts to set up a permanent, um, you know, um, capital for his kingdom. Anyone who's ever been to Ir David, <laughs> that's what we're talking about. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of his reign involved wars. He had to, you know, exercise power, defend the Jewish people. Um, he wasn't looking to, you know, strengthen or expand territory. He was really just looking to make sure that nobody starts up with us because that was, uh, you know, we were, we were always vulnerable right, to this <laughs> then and now. <laughs> that particular piece of real estate is always uh, vulnerable to our neighbors. Yes? How many years in particular was David at the head of you know, the wars and everything. How, how many years was that reign, actually? How long was his reign? I don't remember off the top of my head. I would say... Uh, um, you can calculate since he died and, like... I mean, do I know that off the top of my head? I mean, I think it was 17 or 18 seven, years, something like that. It wasn't It wasn't a very, very long like reign. Um, yeah, something... Young. What? He died young. He died young. Um, well, he died at 70. He died at 70. It depends if you consider that young or not. In those days, that wasn't so young. No, that wasn't so young. Right. Right. He died, at, he died at the age of 70. So I, I'm not sure exactly, but it wasn't, we're not talking 80 years, you know, maybe maybe 20 at the most. I, I, I want to say 17. I'm not sure why that number's popping into my head. I'd have to look it up. I, don't, I just don't remember off the top. Um, okay. So he, um, David, as the great warrior of the Jewish people, leads, leads his army in a lot of these battles and, and starts to maintain a lot of success and, you know, starts to increase the reputation of the Jews against their enemy nations. There is one battle in particular that the text records for us against the nation of Ammon, and they were um, aided by the nation of Aram, and in this particular battle, they were able to um, defeat the Ar Aramanians, I guess is what you would call the Aramim, um, and they made a treaty with the Jewish people, we're not going to mess with you again, we're not going to aid your enemies again, you know, we understand and we recognize your, your strength. Um, the nation of Ammon, however, was not actually put down. They simply retreated. So they, you know, they said, we're not going to fight right now, but they didn't make any kind of peace treaty. And, you know, we know that if you, they're still regrouping, <laughs> then any time they're still a threat. So the next step in the process was David making sure that they were no longer a threat. He was going to go back after the nation of Ammon to put them down and, uh, and make sure they didn't start up with the Jewish people again. So this is where our story picks up. If you look at the first page of Sources, we're in uh, Parakid Aleph, chapter 11 of Shmuel Bet. So it says, Vayhi l'tshuvat hashana l'eit seit hamalachim, v'yishlach David et Yoav et avadav imo, v'et kol Yisrael v'yishtachu et b'nei Amon, v'yatsuru al Raba v'david yoshev v'yushalayim. So it came to pass at the turn of the year, the time when the kings go out to battle, that David sent Yoav and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Amon and besieged Raba, but David... It's interesting, the translation tarried at Yerushalayim. The, the Hebrew is Yoshev. He just, it just sound, you know, it gives it a, an interesting connotation. But basically, he just, he stayed home, right? He didn't go out to this battle. Um, so the first thing <coughs> that we're told here is um, this is not a good idea that he didn't go to the battle, right? Mm -hmm. The king is not the one who should be sitting home on his laurels, especially a king like David, who was such a powerful warrior and such a recognized warrior that he doesn't go. It's, you know, I mean, it, it can be a little depressing to the troops. It can be 
little demeaning to the troops and we're not, you know, we're not good enough to go with you. And um, this was already like the first sign that something not good is going to happen is that he, he decides for whatever reason not to go to the battle. Um, why does he decide not to go? We're not really sure because all the conditions seemed the right thing for him to do. It says that it was the turn of the year and it was the time when the kings go out to battle. So the turn of the year could mean it was the summertime. It's sometimes, and even though like... I don't yeah, I guess the summertime would be the end of the year on a Jewish calendar, right? Yeah. Summer ends and then it's Rosh Hashanah. I was, <laughs> I was thinking January 1st, but that's not what they went by in those days. Um, so it's summertime. I, even in Israel, a lot of the battles take place in the summer because just weather-wise, it's easier to fight when you don't have torrential rains and floods and things like that going on. And also in terms of feeding your troops and supplies, more food is being produced in the summer than in the winter. So it's just practically, it's a, it's a better time to go to war. So you can't say it was difficult, you know, it was a more difficult battle for him than any other time because the timing was right. Um, on top of that, it could be that it was just a year later um, from the last battle with Amon, and he had given them a chance to... Um, see if they'd be interested in making peace. It seems that that wasn't something that they were particularly interested in doing. Um, but uh, the timing was right. You can't say he was too tired. It had been a full year, according to that approach. He had time to rest up and recover from the last battle. Um, <coughs> and even from the Pesukim, it says he sent Yoav, his general. So clearly, if the general is going, this is an important battle. He sent his servants. It said all of Israel went to this war. So you can't say it was an insignificant battle. They didn't need the king there, right? Everything points to the fact that David should have gone, and he doesn't, right? Now, think about it. I mean, everything that's going to happen next, <laughs> which, you know, we, we kind of know already what's going to happen next. If he had only gone to war, what would have been avoided? <laughs> right? All of this trouble would have been avoided. Uh, yes? Maybe it was Shana Rishona with Avigai. Oh, I don't know if the kings observe that, Shana. And I don't know that that, um, you know, in these wars, these were considered milchemet mitzvah. These weren't optional wars. These were, you know, obligatory wars. So the exemption from, uh, you know, a, a new marriage, I don't know if that applied to the king. And it'd be an interesting question. I'm, not, I'm just not sure. Um, okay, let's move on. Pasuk Bet. So it was in that evening. Right? So it, in the evening, David got off from his bed. He walked around to the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Okay? So again, they, the, already it's not looking good for David here. <laughs> the fact that he was just taking a leisurely stroll when this significant battle was going on on behalf of the Jewish people, even if he wasn't there for whatever excuse, which we don't have an excuse why he didn't go, you know, at least he should have been concerned. Situation he should have been room. Davin, right, the situation yeah. room, exactly. Should have been monitoring somehow what was going on. Instead, he's just taking a leisurely stroll while his men are all risking their lives in this battle on behalf of the Jewish people. Um, it, when it talks about where he saw her, so um, apparently that she was, she was in her house, he was on the roof. She wasn't bathing on the roof. You know, we shouldn't think uh, that she was trying to attract this kind of attention. She was definitely in a private area. There's a whole line of thinking in the Gemara. Pot. I'm sorry? He was the peeping Tom. Well, it, okay. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. I would, you know, I would be a little more cautious how we talk about King David. But, um, but yeah, I mean, okay. he was, I mean, if she was in a private place. So there's this whole line of thought through the, through the Gemara and through the Medrash that somehow this was meant to happen. He was destined to be with Bathsheba. And um, he had sort of asked for it. There was this conversation that, that took place between him and Hashem where we know the text of the Shimon Esrei is Eloke Abraham, Eloke Yitzchak, Eloke Yaakov. And David's, you know, observe, observing this text and says, what about Eloke David? You know, why can't I be on that list? I'm, I'm an honorable servant of, of God, and, uh, you know, I, I, I lead the people like the other lead the people. Why can't I be on that list? And so Hashem said to him, look, Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, they were all tested, and they passed their tests with flying colors. You know, you haven't been tested yet. I mean, you know, I'm sure you've had some crises and things like that, but you haven't had a test of your, you know, like 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 they have. So David said, "Test me." Mm. Right? Like according to the Gemara, that's how the yeah, conversation went. That is just, you know, a very dangerous territory to go into. It's hard enough to pass a test that God imposes on us, but to ask for it yourself. And the thing is, apparently, he was told already. God says, "Fine, you want to be tested? I'll test you." And he even told him the nature of the test would be something. 
you know, about, about oh, what he sees he and his eyes. And, yeah, exactly. He was already told to, to get the warning. And, you know, one should just not be that confident in oneself of how they will ever, you know, we, we all say that. We never know what we will be like in a situation until it happens, right? I, I'd love to say that uh, if a house is burning down, I would run in and rescue people. But I don't, I don't know what I'm in that situation. I just don't know. So to, you know, say, well, let me go do it, you know, that's, that's already a little bit risky. We ask Hashem not to put us Right, exactly. We don't want to be tested. Yes. So it says here, eight Erev. So Erev is the beginning of the evening. So okay. what was he doing in bed all day? Uh, so that goes into this also. The Midrash says, no, the Midrash says that if his test was going to be in the sexual arena... So he figured if he's with his wives during the day, then he will sort of get that out of his system, and he won't be as tempted. I, I wasn't going to bring that in, but now that you brought it up, <laughs> now that you brought it up, right? Okay. That was the idea. So, the, I mean, the Gemara there has an interesting side point that with certain things, the more you feed it, the more the desire grows, <laughs> as opposed to the other way around. The more you exercise control, the better you're going to be able to exercise control. He thought it was the opposite. You know, if I have, if I have my chocolate now, I'm not going to be tempted to have it later. Right? But sometimes it's the opposite. Now I remember what it tastes like, and I remember how good it is, and I just I see another piece and forget it. I can't. I have no self control. Right? So that that's what that's the explanation on why he was in bed during that time. If you want to read just the simple you know meaning of the text, it, you can just go back to saying, well, you know, he wasn't behaving properly for when his nation was at war. That he's taking a leisurely nap in the middle of the day. You know, I mean, it, otherwise there, there really isn't a uh, you know a good explanation for that. And there was never any that he was like not feeling well. Um, no, we don't get that. <laughs> you definitely don't get that. <laughs> okay. Um, I was like, yeah, look, maybe he was up late at night and this was his scheduled nap to be able to keep up the pace that he went with. I mean, we can speculate, you know, from now till tomorrow. Yes. But we're, ne- we're never given any cause to suspect him in the past nor in the future. This is actually the only situation that well, he's presented well, with. Except that we talked about last well, week with Abigail. Looking at her legs, <laughs> right. Know, like looking look back, right, he did have that temptation with Abigail, and, and she's the one who prevented him from acting on it. Right. So, you know, here, Bacheva doesn't seem to play as active a role. <laughs> she, well, she you know, we, even we don't even aware. see her perspective at all um, in, in this whole story. We're only told about David's perspective. Right. We're not told about her Are perspective. Ever, ever told? I don't recall that we're ever told about anything from Bacheva's side. Um, I mean, a little bit here and there, like after the after the child yeah, died, the child that they gave birth to, yeah. she didn't. She was afraid to be with David right. again until right. he assured her that it's fine mm-hmm. and your your child is going to be the king. Um, there's some midrashim that talk about her perspective, how she raised Shlomo. Um, mm-hmm. You know, she didn't raise him to be a king; she raised him to be a Talmud Chacham, and that's what qualified him to be a king. I like think we do get some perspective on it, not as not as much as certainly not with this incident as much as we get about David. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was the more public figure. He's the one who we need to know what was going on behind the scenes. Okay, Pesachim, Vayishach David, Vayidro Isha. So he sent and he inquired about who this woman was. Vayomer, Halo Zot, Bat Sheva, Bat Eliam, Eshet Uriah HaChiti. Is it not Bat Sheva, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Chittite? Okay, um, so, I mean, if he sees her and he desires her, what does he need to find out? What's the most important piece of information he needs to find out? Is she available or not? Right. Is she single or is she married? What's her what's her relationship status on Facebook? That's what they gotta that's what they have to figure out. Um, according when you just read the Pusik, the Vayomer seems to be whoever he inquired told him who she was. The Gemara says that it was actually he was talking to himself, mm-hmm. right? Because he had this nevua that somehow he was destined to be with this woman Bathsheba, who was the wife of Uriah Hachiti, and he was just so surprised, like here she is in my line of sight, <laughs> you know, like I I know I'm supposed to be with her, and and it, it's almost as if that nevua harmed him because maybe in some way that justified what he was going to do because he knew that ultimately somehow they were supposed to be together. We, we can't go back and rewrite history and figure out how it would have happened otherwise because it didn't happen otherwise. But somehow it would have happened in the right way had he not gone about it in the wrong way. Right? But that's, that's, that's that his surprise. What? Had he not known that he was going to be tested, he expected this as soon as he saw her, he said, oh, this well, is... Well, I don't know that he was thinking about the test at this point in time. He was thinking more about, again, the Nebua, the Nebua that, that, that he was destined to be with this woman. Be with this woman. Okay. Exactly. But exactly. doesn't it seem that he was using that as, you know, just an aid to his desire? Well, we, we all talk ourselves into things. <laughs> That's for sure. Yes. Quick question. 
אוריה החיתית. Yes. So, חיתים were not Jewish? Right. And so, are there any different laws regarding women from... Well, so the commentaries say that either he, 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 he was, was a, a family convert. of converts, right, that he had converted from the chitim, or he just, they lived in the territory where the chitim lived. So he, it was attributed, like, to the place where he lived, not that he was actually a chitite. Okay. Um, you get the sense that he himself was 100% Jewish, whether it was by birth or by conversion through his family, um, but, but it doesn't seem that he's not Jewish. Okay, Pazik Dalet. Vayishlach Devin Malachim Vayikachecha. So he sends messengers and they take her. Vatavoe la, Vayishkavima, Vihimid Kadeshed, Mitumata, Vateshev El Beta. So they call her in, she comes to him, he, they sleep together. She was purified from her uncleanness and she returned back to her home. So the, te- the text is testifying that she was not Anita, <laughs> that this was not a violation of a, uh, of a man sleeping with a woman who had not gone to the mikvah. In fact, that's what the bathing was. She was bathing as, as part, part of her process to immerse in the mikvah. She was ritually clean. So there was no sin on that end. Oh, thank you. <laughs> right, thank you, exactly. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I mean, who needs soap operas with this going on? Let, let me say a few points about the person that will take some comments. So um, the Abravanel here is extremely harsh on Devin. I mean, really just ripping in. Look at all the things that he did wrong. So one, that he, um, that he has relations with another man's wife. Two, he tries to distract from the, uh, you know, the ancestry of this child. As we'll see in a minute, he tries to bring Uriah home when she gets pregnant so that uh, it looks like you know, the, her husband is the father. Um, three, he's responsible for the death of Uriah because when Uriah refuses to go to the wife, we'll read all this inside, he sends him off to the front of the battle so that, so that they'll get killed. Um, <coughs> four, the Abravanel says he doesn't even allow Uriah to be killed by his own people on his own soil. If David felt he had a right to put him to death, at least give him a death with dignity rather than death at the hands of the enemy. And uh, the, the fifth thing he says is as soon as Uriah is out of the picture and her mourning is over, he marries her. Like there's no second thought about it. It's just like an immediate, uh, an immediate thing. So the Abravanel is very, very harsh on David. The Gemara tries to be, the Gemara is not exonerating David in any way, shape, or form. Um, when the Gemara makes a statement, anyone who says that David sinned is mistaken, yeah. it doesn't mean that he didn't sin. It just means <laughs> he doesn't sin the, the, the sins that we think he sinned, right? If anyone is accusing David of committing adultery, that's not really what's going on here, right? Why? What is the, le- the legality here? Well, the war, war, he, he he the war. Yeah. Exactly. So there was a principle that when, in order to avoid aguna situations mm-hmm. where a husband disappears and then the wife has no idea if he's still alive or not and then she can't remarry because she's ch- literally chained to her missing husband, that to avoid that situation, husbands would either give their wives an outright get before they left on the, con- you know, sort of conditional, conditional that when, should he return, back. we will definitely remarry, right? This doesn't mean anything except protection for you. It's not any statement about our marriage. We will, you know, we will remarry. But, but it could be that every woman who was a, you know, who was alone because her husband went to war was, was divorced. The other possibility was a retroactive get. In other words, they would give the get, but it would only kick in if the husband didn't res- return for X amount of time, whatever the amount of time was. And David as king could certainly ensure that Uriah would not return from battle and the amount of time that he needed to. So even if she, if the divorce hadn't kicked in yet, retroactively, it will kick in back to the time when David was with her. So either which way, he's not committing adultery. Now, is he, you know, is he exercising a loophole? Of yeah. course, a hundred percent, right? It's not. Uh, it, it's certainly not behavior befitting the king of the Jewish people, but nevertheless, <coughs> this is uh, this is how we explain what he did. Um, one second. Let's make sure I'm not missing anything here. Right. Uh, the other justification that's given that he didn't, you know, you can't say he committed adultery is because the pasuk goes out of its way to point out that she wasn't an Edo, right? So. Why would it say, like, if he was committing adultery? That's, it's a much bigger issue that we have to yeah. deal with <laughs> than, uh, you know, so it wouldn't matter if she's a need or not if he's committing the, uh, really, the heinous crime of adultery. So the fact <laughs> that it puts that in exonerates him again from that offense, not from anything wrong, but from that particular offense. Um, the other point to exonerate him from adultery was that if it was adultery, then he wouldn't be allowed to marry her after her husband died, right? Once, uh, if, if, if the, mar- the married couple can't, you know, that who's with each other, they then become forbidden to each other after that relationship. So the fact that he marries Bathsheba and, you know, gives birth to Shlomo HaMelech, who takes over for him, 
that's sort of the you know the OU on that relationship. <laughs> you know, like that that was the stamp of approval that it was an acceptable relationship. How it started, not necessarily, but the marriage was a legitimate marriage, and which it would not have been had he actually been guilty of committing adultery. Right, so it's important. The Gemara wants us to realize that that is not what's going on. Again, not trying to whitewash it and say he was exotic here, but um, at least you know accuse him of the crime he's guilty of, not of the crime he's not guilty of. Okay, so let's move on. Pesake, Vatar Haisha. So she found out that she was pregnant. Vatishlach Vatagei David. She uh, sent a message and told David Vatomer Haranochi, and she said. I'm pregnant, you know, two pink lines. That's uh, that's what's going on over here. Um, apparently, her husband had not been home in quite a significant amount of time. That she was very confident that David was the father of this child. Right? If it was questionable, she might not have bothered the king. Um, it seemed that it was pretty obvious that David was the father. So now David has to figure out, he's got to do some damage control, right? This is really bad. This is not the way he anticipated this happening. I don't, you know, I don't know why he wouldn't anticipate the possibility of this happening, but um, <laughs> the Gemara here, again, it, it points out that David's concern, aside from self-preservation, <laughs> is really, I mean, because he sees himself as the representative and the leader and the role model of the Jewish people. So his his goal here is to avoid a chil Hashem. Right? If I can cover this up, then forget about his own reputation. You know, he he as David himself, he is concerned about the reputation of the kingdom and the reputation of of God with him. So what he's doing by bringing Uriah home, if Uriah would go and be with Bathsheba, then that negates the divorce, which means he would now be guilty of committing adultery. But to him, it's worth it to take that hit, and that's a huge hit. <laughs> He's willing to take that hit to try to avoid the Chil Hashem that would, uh, that would be known if this all comes out. All right, so this is sort of what's going on here. Pazag Zion, Vayavo Uriah Elav, Vayishal David, Lishlom Yoav, Lishlom Ha'am, Lishlom Hamilchama. Can I just clarify? I'm sorry. Yeah. So you're saying that if he comes home, so then he's back with his wife, she's pregnant, but it won't come out that it was from David? Because like, the, cause he'll, be with, he'll, he'll be with his wife. So, so when she's pregnant, it will be, I mean, this is right after. As soon as she, as soon as she establishes will. the fact that she's pregnant, she sends the message to David. But she thinks she's going to fool her husband? Yeah. yeah. Or he thinks she can fool David her. thinks, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I mean, Hot would anyone cool. suspect the king of doing such a okay. thing? Right? I mean, it's, you know, retroactively, in hindsight, sure, we know the story. So obviously that's what happened. But, you know, when you're going through, you wouldn't expect okay. that of your leader. Yeah, you know, certain leaders may be in certain countries, but not not that leader. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That was not something that Look, was. We're uh, talking about it for thousands of years. Yeah, we yeah, have never same. stopped talking. About it. <laughs> okay, um, let's read these two together. By Yomer David Leoria, Rei Levecha or Chas Raglacha. See, after he you know, had their pleasantries, how's it going? How's the battle? How's Yoav? He says you should go home, wash your feet. And Uriah departed from the king's house, and there followed him a mess of food from the king. <laughs> okay, so what essentially is David saying to him? Wash your feet is a euphemism. Right? Go home and be with your wife. That's what he's saying. You know, you've been you've been gone such a long time. You must miss her. You know, take this opportunity while you have a little furlough and go home and be with his wife. And in fact, this this um, masat hamelach. So this translation is: it was food that the king provided for him. When a man is well fed, right? <laughs> when anybody's well fed, we're satisfied. We're happy. We're in a you know in a nice state of mind. David was really trying to set the scene here. The other um, translation for masat is um, torches. Um, that basically David sent an escort with him with lights, you know, they're holding the lights, they're walking him home so that they can see he gets there safely, you know, he doesn't have any hesitations about going home. David is really trying behind the scenes to orchestrate this happening because this is the only way he can see out of this mess that he's created. Right? Okay. Pasuket. Vayishkav Uriah Petach Beit HaMelech. He didn't go home. He stayed by the door of the king's house. At Kol Avdei Adonav, um, with all of the servants of, uh, of, of the king, the lo yarad el beto, and he did not go home. Right? Why didn't he go home? Oh, if you're a soldier, you know, and you get this break, I would think that would be a nice thing. Right? What, what's keeping him from going home? Oh, Kodesh. okay. I don't think anyone attributes that to Uriah, but maybe. <laughs> no, I think as a soldier. later, how can I, how can I 
you know, sleep comfortably in my bed if all my uh, colleagues are out. Exactly. Of war, Which is such a stuff lives. to David because right. that was, you know, David didn't go to war and he was taking this leisurely walk and he was doing all these things and he wasn't at one with his people and here comes Uriah and he's got loyalty to his brothers in the field. You know, that's a house. I should go home and be with my wife and have a nice, you know, have a nice <coughs> meal and, and sleep in a comfortable bed when they're <coughs> out in the foxholes, right? When they're out dodging bullets. It's not bullets in those days, but you know whatever the equivalent yeah. was, right? I, he he just didn't feel right about it, which which kind of puts Uria in an you know you respect so him for that, you admire him for his commitment to uh, you know to his fellow troops. Um, <coughs> another possibility, which isn't you know positive or negative necessarily, but if he went home, then he would have to reissue the divorce to his wife when he left again, uh-huh. and that's a that's a procedure, you know, it's a process with the writing up the get and the get the base in and the whole thing. He said, you know, for one night. It's not worth it. You know, it's like too much effort. I'm just going to go back to battle. Let me just leave things the way they are. And when I'm home to stay, that's when we can, uh, you know, that's when we can take care of this. We can remarry. Um, a third opinion, which is by a, a later commentary, the Das Sofrim says that he has his suspicions of what David's motives were. Ooh. Yes, <laughs> he had suspicions that uh, that maybe this is what David was doing, and he's he's not going to cooperate with the king trying to cover his own tracks. Also, maybe right. once he goes home, it'll be harder to leave the battle, you know? That's a possibility also, that's true. Once you get comfortable, <laughs> you don't want to go back into uh, well, into what you came from. What was the reason David gave for bringing Uriah yeah. back? I mean, didn't Uri, what, 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 what do you want? Why he not? didn't. He didn't give a reason. I don't know. I don't know that the king has to give a reason. You know, he needs him. Maybe he, maybe, you know, he asked them what's going on in the war. And maybe he was there. You know, he brought him home to update him on what's happening in the battle. You know, I, I, I don't know. Okay, Pesachuid. Biagidu le David le mor lo yirad Uria el beto vayomer David el Uria halo mi derech ataba madua lo yirad ata el betacha. So when they told David that Uria didn't go home, David said to Uria, "Why, you know, you've not got." Even read the English, right? I love you, Madua. Right? Why haven't you done this? Why haven't you gone back home? He's trying to convince him that this is a good thing because he sees that his plan is not working out exactly as he had anticipated. But Yomer Uriel David, this is a significant pasuk. Ha Aaron v'Yisrael v'Yehuda Yoshvim v'Sukot v'Adoni Yoav Avde Adoni Alpane Asade Chonim v'Ani Avoel Beti Leachol V'Lishtov. Right? My the Aaron is out there. The soldiers are out there. My 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 commander Yoav, and he refers to him as my master, which is really the term you should be using for the king, not for the king's subordinate. Right? And he's out there, and I should go home, and I should eat, and I should drink, and and sleep with my wife. Right? This is a very strong language that he's addressing the king with. By your life, right? He may have said, I'm not going to do this. Now, what does this constitute here? I mean, this is a, a we, we might respect and admire Uriah for his approach, but this is an extremely disrespectful way to speak to the king. So they say it's more than Malchut. Exactly. And it is. It's not just there, there is, it's not a stretch to say that this is a more than Malchut. This is somebody who is refusing a direct order of the king. Number one, he's not. The king said, "Go home," and he's not following that order. Number two, he's showing more respect to Yoav than he is to the king. Now, he should certainly respect his general. There's no question about it. But to put him as you know in a higher position of uh, of respect than the king, that's a diss to David. And to rebuke David, right, and say, you know, I'm not going to chayecha. You know, you can sit around and and laze around all day while uh, you know while your soldiers are at war. That's not something I'm going to do. Um, you know, the rebuke to the king is also a Mori Um So there, there was no question that David had every right to judge him as a Mori What did he do wrong? No, David, David made uh, this, he didn't put him on trial. He sent him to the battle. Exactly, and exactly. So while he had a legal you know, hold to, to put Uriah to death, he went about the execution the wrong way. Right? He should have been brought in front of his Sanhedrin <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and make the statement. Um, <coughs> even the Gemara, when it tries to exonerate David you know, and, and say he didn't commit adultery, he didn't commit murder, it still says, he, you know, he didn't sin except for with Uriah. Right? It's like, and again, not that he committed murder by killing him. He was, he was deserving of the death penalty, but the way he carried it out, there's no exoneration for that. That was just, you know... Underhanded and clearly to serve his own purposes, not to uh, you know not to punish somebody who was a rebel against the king. Yes. 
Is this the biggest blemish that we find on God? Oh, yeah. As far as I can tell, I think so. Way, and he never lived, I mean, he couldn't live it down. I, I looked it up. He was king for 40 years. 40 years. Sorry, I got that wrong. <laughs> he was born in 1000, the year 1000 BCE. Okay. And he was king for 40 years. 40 years. So if you live till 70, that means he started at the age of 30. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That makes Actually, that makes more sense than saying 17. <laughs> Could it be said to Uriah's credit that if he was suspicious of what was going on, he gave David an opening to resolve the whole thing, and he was ready to self-sacrifice so that there wouldn't be a blemish on the king if he was suspicious. I haven't seen anyone who reads it that way, but if you, you know, if you want to be so... far yeah. yeah. You have a safer coming right. in. Oh, well. You have a safer okay. yeah. 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 Right. okay, let's move on. That's a good bet. Um, right, so now he is delaying him. Right, now he, maybe if he's he's feeling this indignant today, maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day, he'll wear down a little bit and he'll end up going home. But no, Uriah stayed, you know, by the king's palace in Yerushalayim. He did not go home. His plans were not changing. Um, Yud Gimel, Vayikra lo David, Vayochal Pana, Vayesh, Vayishak Rehu. Right, he got drunk. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe if he's like not of saying of, of sound mind, then he'll go home, right? Because he's not thinking straight anymore once the alcohol is messing with his brain. <coughs> but even that, you know, continue the Pasik, it doesn't it doesn't change. He still stays where he is. Um Pasik Yudalid by Hiba Boker. So finally, you know, David gives up. It was the morning. Bayich Bayikhtov David Sefer El Yoav. David writes a, a letter to Yoav, Bayishsach Biad Uriah. Now, think about how much David trusted Uriah. That with a letter that instructs Yoav, to, which we'll read in a second, to put him in the in the in the front lines of the battle, him. the most he dangerous gives, spot, he, he, gives so. he gives it to him to give. Like he knows that Uri is not going to open that letter. If it's from the, I mean, this is just the, you know, in, in our political climate, we just don't have the respect for political leaders that, that you know that exists with the monarchy. There's a fear. There's an awe. There's a respect. Even if you don't like them. You don't mess with them, you know. You don't. You, so, Devin knew that he could trust Uria to uh, to deliver this letter, even even though he, it would be devastating if Uria opened it and found out the contents. He knew it would never happen. Right? But that he just, couldn't get Uria to do the thing with his wife. Right. So he only followed certain instructions. Right. Right. Well, I mean, he followed the. He was a good warrior. Let's put it that way. He was an honorable, you know, member of the military. There, there's certain codes that he's not going to uh, not going to to violate. Um, what do we have two? Pasuk Yedalid. Uh, no, Pasuk Tedvav. Vayichta basefer lemor, havu eit Uriah el mul pnei hamilchama hachazaka, v'shavta me'acharav v'nika v'meit. Right, so put Uriah in the forefront of the, you know, the, the strongest battle and, uh, and leave him there. You know, basically retreat, leave him there, so that he will be struck and he will be killed. All right, this is, I mean, I, I can't imagine what Yoav is thinking when he gets this letter, mm -hmm. but a direct order from the king, you don't refuse that, right? Um, Pasuk Yudalad. Sorry, Tetzayin, I'm looking at, yeah, Tetzayin. Vahi b'shmor Yoav el ha'ir, v'yiten et Uriah el ha'makom asher yada, ki anshe chayel sham. Came to pass, and Yoav kept watch upon the city. He assigned Uriah to the place where he knew the strongest soldiers were fighting. Um, Yud Zion. Vayetsu anshe ha'ir vayilachmu et yoa vayipo min ha'am me'avde David vayomat gam uriah hachiti. The men of the city went out and fought with Yoav, and there fell some of the people, even the servants of David, and Uriah the Chiti also died. Okay. Um, so a few things that are going on here I want to just draw our attention to. Um, why did David kill him like this? Like, why was that the way he chose to carry out the execution? Um, by sending him to the, to the battlefront. It was a heroic death for him. Okay, so it, it's interesting. Could be a, a yeah. right. Let not him die a hero, a hero <laughs> not a rebel. Right. right. If I'm killing him to be a rebel, at least this way he can die with you know like he died in service of his country rather than a rebel. I mean, what's interesting though is his whole justification for killing him was that he was a rebel. <laughs> so you know, it it almost seems like Devin himself is struggling with his motives here. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. But there was no guarantee that he would die. Oh, so that's the second approach, is that basically Dove is leaving it in Hashem's hands. In Hashem's hands. Right. Mm-hmm. If he's deserving, then he'll get killed. If he, I mean, now he's putting him in a situation where it's very likely that he's going to get killed. The odds are stacked well, against him. Miracles could happen. Not everyone got killed. Again. Not right. There, there were some Yoav. people that were with him that Yoav, did. Yoav, uh, Yoav, uh, uh, Right. Well, Yoav, it seems, retreated. Um, David really tried to set up a situation. He said, put him there, and then everyone else should leave him and abandon him. Um, it seems like the, the fighting was intense. That didn't happen, right? That not everybody could get away in time, um, which was not really David's plan. He didn't want to put other people at risk. But I guess war is war, and by definition, people are going to be at risk when they go to war. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, it could be that he just... He was a hundred percent sure of what he was doing, so I'll put him in this position. We'll see what we'll see what Hashem does. Let the chips fall, you know. It, as was God this wants to protect Bathsheba's reputation at all? I didn't How see that in any of the commentaries. Come, you know, so that it was like that would make sense I mean that would certainly make sense it it it, it uh, looks nicer for her if he yeah. dies as a hero yeah. than yeah. than dying as a rebel right. that could very well be it's what a nice nice thought towards her husband uh, well <laughs> I don't know what feeling she had towards her husband that she so easily went to. I, again, that, it's so interesting that there's so much text devoted yes. to what was going yes. on in David's mind yes. and nothing not. really devoted yes. to what was going on in Bathsheba's mind. What so that she, I mean, he didn't rape her. She was her. pregnant. Yeah. She went she willingly. Right. She was pregnant she was with pregnant. the king's child. Okay, so, so what was that about? Yeah. What? Why didn't she say I'm married? Well, she wasn't. Oh, <laughs> she wasn't. Right. She, she, she was she was Why couldn't she say I'm in a relationship? Right. She <laughs> I mean, it <laughs> seems to indicate that she wanted to be with Devin. I mean, I guess that's an honor. Me. This is a man that everybody <laughs> loves and admires and respects. I mean, we saw Abigail was very, you know, very anxious to be wed to him. Mm-hmm. So much that she suggested it while her husband was still alive. You know, I mean, he's a, he's a great catch. And Abigail <laughs> I mean, is one of the many others. It's the king. The other it's just that, it's yeah, she's one of his eighteen. He has all together oh. eighteen. So. It's King David, and we're right. I mean, this is, and, and the king takes interest in you. That's that's pretty flattering. And and I mean, I, I don't know how to judge Uriah. I don't know if we can judge him from you know that one little snapshot we have of how he interacted with the king. But he sounded like a pretty gruff guy. You know, I mean, it doesn't talk like it tells us about the mismatch between Abigail and Nabal. It doesn't describe the relationship, so we can only speculate. But based on that interaction with the king. I mean, you could read it either way. You could read it, he's such, he's so loyal. <laughs> or you can read it, he's, he's kind of disrespectful. No, not just that. He's you not know. interested in his wife. He's not even going to her. Mm-hmm. And He's you a know, soldier. Yeah, right, but right. okay, he's a soldier, he's but he's a married man. Mean. We're talking about her. Or, or, or yeah. he's like, go yeah. and hug yeah. her and say, I'm safe, I love you. Is something happening? <coughs> I mean, does that, is that a stat also like, obviously by marrying the king, you... You know, you have a relationship with the king, you raise your status. But right. Is this a lower status, being married to someone who's a thing to you? No, he said it's... Oh, uh, no, no, because he, he was, was Jewish. Jewish. He was when definitely he was Jewish. Jewish. I, I, I don't know if it was a, a function of status there. I, I don't know. I just, I, I don't know how to answer that question. I, 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 from what I saw, the sources don't deal with that perspective. Maybe it's pretty, you know, maybe we don't need to know it. She didn't play the same role. You know, again, Torah's never meant to be People magazine. You know, it's not just a... <laughs> comb through Sounds the like lives it. of celebrities <laughs> it's to you know what do we learn from from our heroes what do we learn from you know the people who are our role models so you know the the things that are important for jewish history and jewish destiny that's recorded the things that aren't relevant i'm just curious but about very interesting that's not right i mean i'm curious yeah. about it sure but it's not you know that's not that's not relevant information if she was legitimately divorced i don't even know why they had to hide the whole thing well, again, because when those divorces were given, they were given, assuming that when the husband comes back, we're going to remarry. There was still a commitment. Right, right. But he made him not come back, and that's a difference. Okay. That's a different thing, but... Uh, right. Yes. Isn't it mentioned that Bathsheba knew that she was going to give birth to a king? Um, I don't know at that point. David promises her after the Afterwards, first child yeah. dies. Afterwards, yes, yeah. Yeah. but not at but this point. She, no. Did she have any nevuah? Was anything mentioned about her having any nevuah? Um, no, she's not on the list of the of Nibiot, female Nibiot. Nibiot. Yeah, she's not. I mean, I'm not saying she wasn't smart. I'm sure she was a very smart and yeah, perfected no, no, person, no, no. but um, mm-hmm. not. Uh, not on that level. Um, okay, I mean, a third suggestion I saw of why would Devin would kill him like this was because if he tried him in the Sanhedrin and executed him um, and then married Bathsheba, it would all look very suspicious. <laughs> right? I mean, this is, I mean, really, you know, like, 
you, you find this guy, you bring him home, he becomes a married with Malchus, you kill him, and then as soon as he's dead, you marry his widow, and then, then nine months later she has a baby, mm-hmm. right? He didn't you have know, the, to wait 90 days. What? He didn't have to wait 90 days to marry Bachelor. Well, so it says after her mourning period was over that he, that he married her. But um, yeah, it's it's all very sketchy. You know, it's it's definitely all very sketchy, and that's what he was trying to avoid. Um, okay, let's just in the interest of time, we're going to skip a little bit. But essentially, um, <coughs> once Uriah is killed, David sends a messenger. Uh, sorry, Yoav sends a messenger back to David to relay the information. He sends the message in, in a way that. Uriah dying is sort of a side point because he doesn't want the messenger to be suspicious that this is really the you know the idea that he's trying to convey. He talks about the battle and how they made a mistake. They went too close to the walls of the city, and um, you know they they learned it actually from Gidon. If you remember the story of Gidon, that uh, a woman you know they were by the wall. A woman threw something down and and uh, and, and killed them. Like what 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 an insult that a woman is able to kill someone in battle. You know, back in the days when it was brute force, that was a thing, right? We know that also by. Um, Story of Yael and Devorah and Barak, right? Oh so when God. Barak refused to go without Devorah tagging along, they said, "Well, okay, you can go. You're going to win, but the glory of the battle is going to be through a woman, yeah. right?" That was so. Uh, anyway, that, that's a side point. It's not here, not there, but um, but that's how the message was relayed to David. And um, let's skip to Pesach Um so after the messenger relays all the information, David says, "Vayamer David el hamalach, kot tamar el Yoav, al yera be'enechet hadavar hazeh." Right? I'm not. I'm not mad. I don't think he did anything wrong. Everything is fine. Ki chazo chazo tochal hacherev hachazek lachamacha el ha'ir v'harsat v'chazkehu. Right? He sends him back with words of inspiration and words of chizuk, and you know these things happen in war. Right, the whole way Yoav tried to frame the message in a way that the messenger wouldn't realize it's about Uriah it was more about the failure of the battle. Um, David is responding to, you know, even though he's understanding the code that's being passed along, he's saying, "Don't worry, it's all good. Go back, finish, you know, fight, and 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 it's wonderful." He made Uriah Isha. So when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, a teaspoon al bala. She, uh, you know, she eulogized her husband, but she mourned over him. The avor ha'evel. When the mourning was over, vayishlach David vayasfai al beito batehilo leisha. Right, just like what happened with Neville and Abigail. As soon as Neville was gone, he sends for Abigail. <laughs> she marries him. As soon as Uriah is out of the picture, now there was definitely more urgency with the marriage happening sooner rather than later in this case than in the Abigail case. But um, but he, he brings her home. It's interesting um, here that uh, Kafavit says Eshet She's not called Batsheva. Right. So we said that about Abigail last week right. also. That even after um, Neville was dead, she's still referred to as Eshet Neville because there's something a little underhanded about how the marriage came to be. Um, so yeah. So she married David. Um, she had a son with him, and it says Vayera Hadavar Sherasa David Be'enei Hashem. Because if David is thinking to himself. You know, this this worked out very well. Yes. <laughs> you know, everything is now in place. By the plan. I you know, I pulled the wool over everybody's eyes. Nobody sure. suspects it's not the headlines, it's not, you know, going through Twitter feeds or anything like that. <laughs> one you know, one person you can't do, one entity you can't deceive, right. right? God knows what's happening. <laughs> God knows what happened and he is none too pleased. Again, forgetting that it was it wasn't murder, it wasn't adultery, it wasn't any of those things, it still was not the way things should have happened. Certainly not the king is the Jewish people. Yes. It's interesting because it shows how particular HaKadosh Baruch Hu is about everything. What do you mean? I mean, it, it points out that, he, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not happy with this. Oh, yeah. Even though, yeah. according to the letter of the law, according to the letter of the law, he didn't, he didn't, uh, he had well, there's the certainly a spirit of the law as well, that if anybody is expected to uphold, it would be the king. Okay. So now let's see <coughs> the follow-up, well, right? The yeah. aftermath. Yes. Who was everyone supposed to think this baby belongs to? David. David. It, was a, it was premature. It was Isn't born a couple own? months early. You know, that, that happened. <laughs> that happened. <laughs> I have to say, with my, with my fifth child, 
So it worked out. My husband had been trying for years and years to get the Federation to approve a March of the Living trip. We were living in Detroit at the time, and um, they wanted to take Orthodox, conservative, or reform teens all together. And they finally got the approval. I mean, this was really his baby, and I use that expression, you know, to, to make this trip happen. And I just found out that I was due right at the time he was supposed to be in Poland, right? Mm -hmm. So I said to him, I mean, it was baby number five. It wasn't baby number one. Thank God I had, you know, relatively uneventful deliveries. So I said, you know what? You go. <laughs> like, you go. I'll be fine. I'll figure it out. I'll have well, someone will come stay with me. Um, so it turned out we asked my mother-in-law to come stay. He was going to come home early from the trip. But, you know, just in case I gave birth early, he would be back in time for my due date. But in case I gave birth early, I wanted someone to be there to help with the kids and whatever. So we, we couldn't tell my mother-in-law when my due date was because she, would, she wouldn't understand. What are you crazy? You're going off to Poland when your wife's having a baby. So we, you know, we told a little white lie and said my due date was two weeks later than what it was. And we just need the extra pair of hands. So she comes. She goes, my husband makes it back in time for the delivery, but the baby was actually like 10 days late, oh, wow. and he was 9 pounds, 7 ounces. <laughs> and my mother-in-law, when we called her, she's like, that's a big baby yeah. for two weeks early. <laughs> you know? like, that's a big baby. <laughs> so somebody actually snitched on us at the show and Zuffer that told her, like, can you believe she let you know she let Steve go away. You know? She's like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> so we were busted at that point. But uh, <laughs> but in any case, that's uh, you know sometimes Never babies born early. Um, okay, let's uh, let's see what happens now. How David how this is all brought to him. It says, Hashem et Natan el David." Um, Hashem sends the prophet Natan to David. So he's going to give him a mashal exactly. But David doesn't know it's a mashal. He thinks it's a case. That he has to pass judgment on. Right? There were two. There were two men in the city. One was rich and one was poor. Right? The rich man had lots of cattle, lots of flocks. Um, <coughs> you know, he was very, very well, well, um, well taken care of. Gimel the Larash Ankol, but the poor man had almost nothing. But he had one little lamb that he had bought, and he, and he raised it. And it grew together with him and with his children. Right, and uh, they they ate, ate for ate together, and they drank together. And it laid with him. Right, it was a little pet that he had. And it was like a daughter. Right, I mean, it's like he's really playing this up. I mean, and David has no clue where this is coming from. Right, he has no, also, no. It doesn't sound clue. like Uriah, you know. I mean, right, even, right. It's not an exact analogy. Like the tender care. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, it's that. What it's definitely not an exact analogy. And vayavo helech leish haashir vayachmol lakachat mitzano mibkaro, and a traveler came to the rich man and he spared to take from his flock la asod la oreach habalo. And um, <coughs> to dress um, for the wayfaring man that was that had come to him, vayikach et kivsata ish harash, and he took the poor man's lamb, vayaseha leish haba elav, and he dressed it for the man that had come to him. Right, essentially, what's going on in this pasuk? He's saying that uh, the rich man took the poor man's one little sheep. Right, all he has little lambs, little shepsula. That that's what he had. Mm -hmm. And the rich man, in order to take care of somebody, he stole it from the poor man. When he had plenty of his own, mm -hmm. he stole it from the poor man. I mean what what what's what's, really what's he really right. saying here, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it's interesting. Rashi points out that this is sort of a subtle hint to the Yitzhara. How does the Yitzhara work? It starts as a traveler, right? A passerby. That's how the Pusik starts. It describes the passerby. It's just sort of something that, you know, you see going by, but you're not really tuned into. And then it turns into a guest mm -hmm. who stays for a bit, not a permanent residence, but who stays for a bit, and then ultimately is the ish, right? It's, it's now the master of the house, mm -hmm. right? So again, these subtle messages that the prophet is giving to David, who is not hearing them on a conscious level, <laughs> definitely not hearing them on a conscious level. Um, he does leave out the detail that, um, that the rich man kills the poor man to get the sheep. He doesn't say that. He just says he stole it from him, which which is actually very poignant because, you know, if David's going to be indignant over him stealing it, how much more so, right, when he finds out it's him and he killed him. Um, okay. So, Pesachai, Vayichar af David Vayish Ma'od. David was incensed about this story. Vayomer el Natan, Chai Hashem, Ki ben Mavet Ha'ish Ha'ozezot. 
right? That is not the punishment for someone who steals to be to put them to death. But David feels like it's so wrong, right? It was just the it was just there's no justification for it that even <coughs> that he should be executed for his lack of compassion for his cruelty here. I mean, again, David, it, it's just so interesting. Like you know, the, the text is brilliant. Like he has no idea that he's talking about himself yet. Um, and this is the halacha that when you steal something, you got to pay it back fourfold. Ekev Asher, where am I? No, the next page here. For the um, et hadavar hazeh, miyal asher lo chamal. Right, so it's basically, you see that David ends up paying back fourfold for what he did to Uriah. What are the four punishments David gets? One is with the baby that's born from that relationship, that baby dies. Two is the trouble he had with his son Amnon, who is involved with tr- tr- trouble number three was he raped a, a daughter Tamar, and then four is the rebellion of Absalom. So with four children, he gets paid back, and that's his you know his four paybacks for uh, for stealing Bathsheba, or quote unquote stealing Bathsheba. Um, the death on top of that, he feels like that's just you know that that he deserves for his for his cruelty. Right? He's got to pay it back, and then let's kill him after that. I mean, that's really you know, this is David is so incensed. So he says, this is the key pasuk Zion. Vayomer Natan al David, Ata Haish. I'm talking about you, right? I mean, you imagine the power of that moment where the light bulb goes off in David's head, and this realization just hits him, right? What do you think you're talking about, right? It, it, and, it, and the wheels start to turn until David understands. Ko Amar Hashem Yisrael Anochi Mishachticha Lamelech Al Yisrael Anochi Hitzalticha Miyad Shaul. Right? That said, Hashem, God of Israel, I made you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Shaul. And you know, for several psukim, he gives a speech um, about everything that he had done, and he had. The, he, he was married to Michal, and he was married to, some say he had some of the wives of Shaul he was able to marry, and he inherited the kingdom, right, just sort of making the parable more real. Like, you had all of these things. You were the wealthy man in the story. You had all of this. Why did you have to go and do this? And he says to him now, that in, in Pasuk Yud, the sword is not going to depart from your house forever. Right? You, because you despised me, God is saying. Like you look, look at what you did. You, you're trying to, to stop a chil Hashem. You caused a chil Hashem. You caused a terrible chil Hashem by this, and uh, and this is what's going to happen. Take a, we'll just skip. I mean, he goes on um, with his rebuke, but look at pasuk Yud Gimel. By Yomer David al Nasa. After David, after Natan finishes his rebuke, right? This is the last one. This yes. is really the key. Was uh, in turning this whole story around. By Yomer David al Natan, Chatati Lashem. He accepts the rebuke, right? He doesn't start saying, wait a second, you know, I didn't commit adultery. She had a divorce, right? Wait a second. Or yeah, let me tell you what he said to me. Let me tell you how he embarrassed me. Let me tell you how he shamed me in front of all the people and, and, you know, and and was disrespectful and deserved to be... David doesn't launch into any excuses, even though he had them, even though everybody else launches into those excuses on David's behalf. When the prophet makes him realize the evil that he had done, the, the damage that he had done to God's reputation, the reputation of the kingdom, David has two words. Chatasi Right Now, think about it for a minute. Let's back up a second. Shaul HaMelech, right? What was his sin? He didn't, didn't listen to the word. He didn't kill out all of Amalek. And as a punishment for that sin, he loses the kingdom. Now, why didn't he kill out all of Amalek? Because he wanted to offer some of the animals as carbono. Because he thought it would be a bigger Kiddush Hashem to kill the king later in front of everybody instead of in the midst of the battle, right? He had such good intentions, King Saul. He had such good intentions. And the there weren't, like, you know, long, I mean, at least he didn't think there would be these long-lasting ramifications of, of not destroying everybody, because he assumed at some point they will all get destroyed down the road. He really thought that he had done his job, and he had done it well, and the reason he didn't do it exactly was because he had good reasons for not doing it exactly, right? Compare that sin to what David did with Bathsheba. Which was worse? 
I would think what Devin did with Bakshev is much worse. <coughs> much worse. I mean, look at the damage to the reputation. I mean, it becomes a laughing stock of the world. Yeah, but right? Everyone's talking about the king and the woman and the pregnancy and the dead husband. I mean, it's like a, it's a soap opera. Like it is a people the, magazine, the dead right? A media it's media. Media. <laughs> I would think it's worse. And yet, I'm not saying Devin had an easy punishment, but we'll see. I mean, we're not going to see the psukim here, but if we keep reading the psukim, his, his punishment is lifted a little bit. He's saying he's not going to get killed because he admitted what he had done wrong. But but the point was, De- Shaul lost the kingdom over this. But it was a direct commandment from Hashem. You know, True. It was the word, you know, here True. it's like, it, you know, like some people say, well, she was divorced, you know, there were all these mitigate. Right. But again, here it was the direct word. True, okay, so, we, can, we can make that argument. I, I agree. You can definitely make that argument. But I, just in terms of the reputation to the kingdom, Right, objectively look at, or maybe subjectively, maybe I'm looking at it subjectively, looking at it. It just seems what you know what David did was so much worse than what Shaul did, and yeah, Shaul lost the kingdom. But also, yeah. Shaul tries to when he's what he also tries to explain it away. That's right. that's the whole right. key. Right. You know, and that when he is confronted, when Shaul is confronted, he's like. Well, the people, you know, they wanted me to bring the animals, and I'm waiting, and this and that and the other. But right, it, whereas whereas David doesn't do any of that, and David could, right? We know his excuses here. We know how he could exonerate himself. None of that. He just says very simply, let me, let me give you an analogy. So um, Rav Soloveitchik compares the um, the original sin, Chet HaKadmon, of eating from the Eitz Adas, to the original sin of the Jewish people, which was the Chet HaEgel. Right? They're both original sins. One is the original sin for individual mankind, and one is the original sin for the Jewish nation. Right. So what what it, what was Adam and Chava's sin? They ate, you know, they ate a trafe apple. It wasn't an apple, but that's Christian right. theology. But they, you know, they were told they can't eat it, and they ate it. What was the sin of the Jewish people by Chet Ego? About Azara. I mean, maybe not outright about Azara, but, you know, which is the worst sin? Chet Ego, I would say, is a much worse sin, right? What was the punishment? Are, are we still living with the ramifications of the sin of Chet Ego? Not really. <laughs> but are we still living with the ramifications of the sin of Adam and Chava because they ate something treif? I mean, I'm not minimizing eating treif, but come on. You know, I mean, treif and a Vodazara? <laughs> I mean, it's like, wh- why? So beautifully, the Rev says, when, you know, the Jewish people were confronted that they had sinned, they repented. They acknowledged their mistakes. They, you know, they, they said, we're wrong. We have to fix this. When he confronted Adam and Chava, what did Adam say? She made me do it. It's she the woman, the, the woman that you gave me, right? <laughs> she made me do it. When he confronted Chava, it's the snake that made me do it. What's the poor snake going to do? You know, he's got nothing. He's got no defense. There's no one to point a finger at. Okay? The, the, the ramification is, in the, is, is not the fact that somebody failed or that someone made a mistake. We're human. We're going to make mistakes. That's just the reality of the human condition. Some of us will make worse mistakes than others. And it's not, it's not, not necessarily any guarantee who's going to make the worst mistake, because Devin made a pretty bad mistake here. The question is, how do you respond to it when you're confronted with it? If you try to make excuses and you try to you know, it, it, it wash, defend and whitewash what I did, that's not what God is looking for. God's looking for someone who can take an honest look at themselves and see the ugly thing that's there and say, what can I do to fix this? Okay. Where, does David, where does David get this from? So it's actually, it's in his DNA. Mm-hmm. Because think back to the story of Yehuda and Tamar. Mm-hmm. Right? That was also a very embarrassing situation for Yehuda. He sleeps with someone who he thinks is a prostitute on the side of the road. He goes back to try to pay her for her services. He had given her some of his things as collateral. When he goes back to pay her, they can't, they can't find her. And everyone says, there is no prostitute who sits on the side of the road. What are you talking about? So he's mortified. Like, I don't, you know, let's just hope that this disappears and doesn't come back to haunt me. Right. Well, guess what? It comes back to haunt him when his daughter-in-law is pregnant. And he wants to have her killed for committing adultery because she was, you know, technically engaged and supposed to be married to his younger son, who he had no intention of giving her to. And when she puts the ball in his court, right, when he's publicly judging her and she pulls out his individual monogrammed items and says, the person who's responsible for my pregnancy is the person who owns these things. So Yehuda could have very easily covered it up, pretended he didn't see it, nobody else recognized that they were his things, had her put to death, and the story would have been over and there would have been no embarrassment or shame on him whatsoever. But what does he do? What are his two words? Sadka mimeni. She is more righteous than I am. Right? He accepts that he made a mistake. 
He accepts that he made a terrible mistake in judgment, right? And then what happens as a result? The, the lineage of kings is born as a result of that, right? Making mistakes and failing and, and, and sinning is not necessarily <coughs> going to be something that's going to lead somebody to a, a point of no return, right? But the point is you have to acknowledge that you need to return. You can't start making excuses and justifications and exonerations and it was okay and it wasn't really this and it wasn't really that and it was that one's fault. That doesn't get us anywhere, right? And, and why, I mean, why was Yehuda chosen to be the king? Yosef, I think, probably would have been a better, uh, a better choice. Yosef proved himself as a king. Yosef proved that he was a, a, a person that had tremendous leadership qualities. But Yosef was a little too perfect. I mean, really, think about it. Yosef was too perfect. He didn't do anything wrong. I mean, okay, you could argue when he was younger, he made his brothers jealous or whatever, but even then, you know, he was just giving Nebua on his dreams. His brothers misinterpreted it. He, he withstood the temptation by Asha Paro every step of the way. Uh, Asha Potiphar, sorry. Every step of the way, you know, he, was, he, he became beloved in the household till he rose up to be second to the Pharaoh. Right? Who can relate to that person? <laughs> Somebody who's so perfect, we can't relate to that person. We need a leader who's going to show us what to do when we fail. How do you stand up and how do you accept responsibility? And how do you move forward from there? So while, it's, yes, it's a terrible shame on David and Melech that we're sitting here in a room thousands of years later, you know, mocking him for, for what he did and the mistake. Hopefully we're not mocking. Learning about what he did and, we, you know, we're not letting this die. You know, we're not letting this story go to the grave. But the reality is, the end of the story is that he stands up. You know, he might have fallen down, but when he stands up, now he's standing a little taller. Now he's standing a little higher because you grow from your mistakes, right? You, you become a better person because you accept responsibility. They say of David, he is the paradigm, he is the poster child of a Baljuba. The, the Medrash says that they had to change his sheets every single night after this incident because he cried himself to sleep. He cried over the harm and the damage that he did. He never got over it. You know, he never stopped trying to make up for it. And we don't have to read it inside, but the, take a look at it yourself. The last couple of pages is um, Perak Nun Aleph of Tehillim. This is what he wrote after Natan Hanavi came to him. This is the, the famous verses, um, uh, song, Lev Tahor Barali Elokim, right? You should make me a, a new heart, Come, give me a new spirit. Don't, don't cast me away. Oh. I mean, it's just, it's so beautiful, and it's it, not just in the language, but in the message and the idea. I mean, it just, we'll, we'll end off with just one line, and Pasuk uh, uh sorry, Yudchet, we'll read in English, you don't wish a sacrifice, or I should give it to you. You don't desire a burnt offering. God doesn't need me to throw him a bone to say, okay, God, I'm sorry I did something wrong. Let me give you something to appease you. What does he want? The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. God, you will not despise a broken and a crushed heart, right? That's the transformation that David went through as a result of this. Did he fail? Miserably. <laughs> did, he do, did he cause some damage that couldn't be undone? Yes. I mean, that's a painful lesson, a mistake. Sometimes we can't undo the damage that's done. But did he, you know, make a, a tremendous statement about accepting responsibility and how people grow from what they do and, uh, you know, and... and um, showing that chuba is possible no matter how far gone you've become, that's really the legacy of David. I, I hope that this will be the legacy of David from this story. Not the mistake, but how he dealt with the aftermath of it. And he paid a heavy price. He definitely pays a very heavy price with his children as a punishment for what he did. He doesn't get off scot-free just because he admitted that he did something wrong. But you see, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't lip service. It was something that he really felt in his gut, in his heart, in his soul, that he failed, and he wanted to make up for that. He wanted to, you know, wanted to, to bring the glory back, but, you know, glorify the name of Hashem instead of uh, instead of profaning it. I'll leave us there. Thank you so much. There's a lot more we could say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, we only have an hour. <laughs> oh, yeah. So next week there's no class. It's Thanksgiving. Um, the week after that we are going to talk about Ma'acha, um, who was the Eshet Yifat Toar and the mother of both Avshalom and Tamar. So we'll so, get into those stories a little bit. We first. don't need this well. <laughs> Right, next week's Thanksgiving, there's no school, there's, uh, you know, we'll all be home eating turkey. <laughs> <laughs> or something like it. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.